Good morning. I'm Paula Mabey. I'm the Chief Scientist and Observatory Director of NEON. Um, I've been at NEON, served at NEON for two and a half years, close to the start of full operations of NEON, which began three years ago. Um, my own research background is in the area of data interoperability, developmental biology, evolutionary biology, and I served at NSF as Division Director for the Division of Environmental Biology for a couple of years. On behalf of Battelle, I want to um, say that we are very excited to be here this morning and to be co-hosts, one of the co-hosts for this event, and that it's in person. So really looking forward to the next couple of days. So I'm gonna present an overview of the National Ecological Observatory Network called NEON, with a focus on the things that are different from many of the facilities here, how we collect our data, and a few examples of the science that are being done with it. So first thing, uh, within NSF, we're funded by the Directorate of Biological Sciences. We are the only large facility in bio, and as such, we're an observatory pointed at the Earth, at the biological systems of our planet. NEON was designed over 20 years ago to understand and forecast the effects of environmental change. And as evident from the recent IPCC report, it's a timely and visionary investment and well positioned to help our scientific community work with enough data, data at the right scale, to do this. The, more specifically, NEON was positioned to understand the interaction between the causes and responses to environmental change, to these grand challenges such as climate change, land use, and invasive species, and looking at the responses at a, from the standpoint of biotic and abiotic factors. NEON is a distributed observatory. Um, these sites um, is located at 81 sites across the US. So these sites, 47 of which are terrestrial, the green dots, and 34 aquatic, the blue ones, are located in and representative of 20 unique ecoclimatic regions of our country. And these range from Alaska, North Slope of Alaska, actually, to Hawaii in the Pacific and Puerto Rico in the Caribbean. And in full, they span about a quarter of the longitudes and latitudes of our planet. By design, many of these sites are co-located with other networks that are supported by NSF and other agencies, including NSF BIOS Long-Term Ecological Research Network, LTER, USDA's LTAR, Long-Term Agroecosystem Research Network, um, Smithsonian's Forest Geo, and NSF GEO's Critical Zone Network. So lots of co-location by design. So over this enormous spatial scale, NEON is collecting and making freely available using FAIR principles, over 180 data products for a 30-year time span. NEON is an ecological observatory and it's globally unique in this respect. Unlike many of the astronomical and other facilities here that enable profound understanding by looking back in time, NEON is about the future. You could say that the reason for NEON's existence is to be able to make predictions about the future of our ecosystems. And this requires long-term data. NEON is set up for 30 years, and why is this? So just a little reflection on this. Earth is a very dynamic planet, and change occurs at a number of different scales. So on the one end, the extreme, you have geological change on the order of billions and millions of years slow movement of the tectonic plates. And on the other end, you have atmospheric changes that occur hourly, which we think of as weather and climate. And it's at this level that data have been collected for a very long time. So that we know, for example, that the average surface temperature of the earth has been warming over the last century. So in between these extremes, we have timescales of biological change, and by which I mean evolution and ecology. Ecological change occurs at a much faster time scale than evolutionary change, and we can measure it in our lifetimes, hence 30 years. <laughs> um, NEON will provide data at these appropriate ecological timescales of decades, thus enabling prediction. So ecological data also need to be continuously collected, and this requires an enormous amount of operational attention, complexity and skill to minimize gaps in data. 
In other words, the continuity of operations is critical to the value of these data, and it takes the entire NEON team to do this. Particularly in light of the distributed nature of our assets, we're in the front line for natural hazards somewhere almost every day. And because of this, we focus on climate resilience across our assets and frankly, whatever it takes to produce these data streams that are as gap free as possible. Neon data are standardized. So the concept of the observatory as a distributed network essentially forced the requirement of systems and standardization at a scale that's never been attempted in the ecological community. Standardization is a key feature of NEON. So traditionally, ecological studies have been done on a regional basis using methods and collecting data sets that are obviously best suited for the research questions that are being asked. So these data that are collected so separately across our continent are very difficult to sometimes impossible to compare because of these variable sampling methods and different research questions. So for NEON, it was important to standardize what was being collected, how it was being collected, the units that measure, that it, in which it's being measured, and calibration methods, algorithms, et cetera. So um, <clears throat> standards, which might be not so interesting from some people's standpoint, I think are incredibly profound. Um, they enable our modern world. And looking back in history, it seems that they're driven by grand thinking um, and necessity. So there are two quick examples, one from my own field of evolutionary biology, drawing on Carl Linnaeus, whose dream was to systematize the entire diversity of life on the planet into a single hierarchical taxonomic classification scheme. Um, that's been done, and this enables incredibly sophisticated evolutionary analyses that are fundamental to our, our way of life and developing vaccines. Um, the second example comes from the introduction of railroads to span the entire US. Again, big thinking. And this forced a standardization of time um, and it, the invention of time zones in the US and then uh, globally. Um, until that point, time was a local matter. So we forget about that. Um, when I've talked to NEON scientists about the development of its standards, they point out that it's often really not appreciated how difficult it is to actually standardize. So for field sampling, the NEON is faced with, with many unique challenges, needing one protocol general enough to accommodate the tundra to tropical forests. Then you explode this across all the data that we're collecting, and this is a very, very tall order. You have to <clears throat> adapt protocols. This is an example from the aquatic macro invertebrate sampling protocol, which means a person getting in the stream and basically picking up aquatic bugs. Um, and so how do you do this in a standardized way when the stream dries up and trees fall over it? And uh, again, across all these habitats. So we have um, excellent training to maintain the standards across people and all sorts of, of beautifully written protocols for that rigorous training. So by virtue of its unique scale, then NEON um, uh, enables analysis, comparison, and interoperability. So next I wanna describe NEON's data collection systems, which are co-located in time and space. So NEON collects data using automated, that's nice, thank you. <laughs> automated instrument systems with field um, personnel for observational sampling and airborne observation platforms for remote sampling. So these are best understood by going to a NEON site and in lieu of this, I have a four minute walkabout video that I am going to show you. Okay. All right. Um, instrumented systems. NEON has its iconic towers at each terrestrial field site, equipped with sensors that measure various aspects of the atmosphere, such as CO2 flux. And from the tower, you can see plots and grids for other kinds of ground measurements that are laid out near the tower. As just one example, our soil arrays and through fall instruments collect data that can be used to study heat flux, precipitation, and more. Our aquatic sites are also fully instrumented. Sensors and gauges collect data on freshwater ecosystems from streams to lakes. And at nearly all of our sites, you'll find cameras that capture images every 15 minutes 
and records seasonal changes or phenology. We maintain over 11,000 sensors across our sites, and these are maintained using preventative and predictive approaches by our instrumentation team. The instrument hut contains gas analyzers, data storage network, and UPS equipment that support the tower. In addition to these permanent sites, we also have mobile sites that researchers can request as part of our assignable assets program. Now we'll take a look at the observational sampling. This is what people traditionally think of when they think of ecology fieldwork. So this includes things like taking blood samples from small mammals through trapping, vegetation structure analyses, uh, ticks, mosquitoes, ground beetle sampling, and much, much more. So we support these data collection efforts through regional operations that are led by the field science team that includes more than 100 full-time field ecologists and over 250 field technicians, of which most are recruited seasonally, which is a, a huge annual, annual effort. This is a diverse group of people, often finishing or finished with undergrad degrees, and from all over the country. So these field staff are carefully trained in uh, standardized protocols. They're involved in precisely scheduled field work and use mobile applications for controlling data entry. They return to domain support facilities, as you see here, to conduct any necessary lab work. Neon specimens from across the field sites, around 100,000 annually, are then sent to the Neon Biorepository, which is a permanent archive for them in Arizona State University. So along with our infrastructure and observations, we have the Airborne Observation Platform. The Twin Otter aircraft are designed to, to fly low and slow, which allows us to collect high quality data with payloads, including the neon imaging spectrometer, LIDAR, and high resolution RGB camera. The neon airborne sensor operators who are full-time neon staff run the instruments and carefully look at the data as it's being collected. Remote sensing images like these have incredibly high resolution data, the ground cover, canopy, and all the vegetation. We schedule our flights across the country to collect during peak greenness and coordinate with the field teams that are manually collecting data on the ground. So remember that as this remote sensing happens below you, the beetles are being collected, the stream invertebrates are sampled, and instruments are picking up a world of data linked data, co-located data of their own. Neon data are then checked for quality using a computer called the hotel kit. And ultimately this is processed and made available to researchers through the Neon website. So um, just, uh, let's see, that was, that was your walkabout. I understand that 60 of you are going to our facility, so that's fantastic. Um, but to, to sum up this anyway, um, NEON collects data using these automated instrument systems, the observational sampling, and the remote sampling. The volume and uh, variety of NEON data that we collect are amazing. So, um, I wanted to point out that they are enormous um, and heterogeneous. We collect about 400 terabytes a year of raw data across these 180 data products. So upper left-hand corner has the, the data coming in from our 11,000 sensors and the instrumented systems. This accounts for only about 10 terabytes of data, but the data points are coming in at a high rate and lots of them. So size isn't everything. About 5.6 billion data points per day. This is similar to Visa in terms of the volume of transactions, but VisaNet handles only 1,700 transactions per second at an average of 150 million transactions worldwide, which is less by an order of magnitude compared to NEON. Observational systems, the data are very small, but collected manually, requiring a lot of re revisions and updating. And the data from our airborne platform make up most of these 400 terabytes per year. We're in the process of moving these data to the Google Cloud, which will make the computation for our users much easier. 
The quality of our data is a top priority of the program. The data quality program is dependent on the full integration across all parts of the observatory. This includes the scientists and staff from the NEON programs that you see on the right there. It also includes significant input from members of the external community, members of our advisory groups and our resource users, as well as, of course, the NSF. And these interactions enable us to build and just continuously improve the QAQC methods throughout the entire life cycle of our data. NEON data products that are minted um, with associated DOIs are available for download through um, the data portal and also through our API. As I mentioned, we also collect physical samples through the biorepository, which holds these samples for loan or consumption. So each physical specimen has a record that's tied to a particular location and time to which all of the other data that are collected and co-located are tied, making this an incredibly rich and extended digital, digital network. It's also really important to remember that each physical specimen is a gold mine of data that is not exposed. For example, a tick in our collection has a, a genome, a microbiome, and a thousand traits that could be measured. Neon data are challenging and challenging to the field of ecology to work with. These are big data at a high spatial scale, the software skills, the modeling skills, and frankly, the, across a very, very broad community, including many groups that we want to, to very carefully and specifically serve um, through for our many broadening participation efforts that we can talk about more um, later. Um, we feel that our partnerships are key to building these kinds of training exercises and, and to frankly, to all of our broadening participation. We have nearly 200 partners shown on the chart there, ranging from training and fair data and research partners to those involved in education, inclusion and relationship. And frankly, also over a hundred partners with which we share our NEON sites. Getting the data into the hands of researchers and getting it used for discovery is a huge emphasis of NEON, particularly at this point. NEON, um, so I'm gonna give you a couple of examples here. Um, the first is from our NEON Assignable Assets Program, which I mentioned in the video. So it makes various components of NEON's infrastructure available on a cost recoverable basis. So many researchers want to collect their own data in relation to the NEON data, adding their own sensor, requesting field staff to collect particular samples. Um, and a mid-scale group, the picture of their research on the right there, is working on edge computing in relation to wildfire. They recently received a, a rapid award for us to deploy a NEON mobile deployment platform in an area with a controlled burn. So we set up the tower with standard NEON sensors and they mounted additional edge computing sensors, streamed the data during the burn. So this was not only critical for their research, but it was also great for us to understand how our cyber infrastructure um, could be used and how it could be um, evolved in relation to external community demands. The next example comes from our relation, uh, collaboration with NCAR. Um, with NSF funding and evolving from a series of joint workshops and in collaboration with the NSF CI Compass, uh, we created a cyber infrastructure tools that link NEON data to the NCAR modeling capabilities, specifically the community um, Earth system model and the community land model. So this is creating a containerized and highly accessible version of the NCAR model for community use. NCAR gets that containerized model and the improvements to the model. And from the NEON standpoint, this provides gap filled data on a rapid timeline to serve to our community and model data for NEON sites. And further, the model returns information that we use to improve NEON data. So even though full operations have only been in play for three years, these data are being used in creative ways and at a continental scale by researchers. So this is a, a very recent paper that used NEON data from across the US, from all domains except Hawaii. They compared NEON imaging sp uh, spectroscopy from our airborne platform and vegetation data collected by our field teams and looked at the correspondence 
called ground truthing, and showed that at the landscape level, the spectrometer data captures changes in plant species composition across all major biomes of the US. So this is, this is big. Um, basically, that changes in plant species composition and diversity can be assessed with spectroscopy at this spatial scale of spaceborne missions, which gives close to real-time biodiversity monitoring which is fantastic from the standpoint of seeing what's happening on Earth and also from the standpoint of forecasting. So this is an exciting um, paper. Couple of um, examples here from the, from the ground, um, soil samples. So NEON collected and archived soil samples at the outset of operations. And these soil samples are held actually in Boulder at our facility and are in hot demand by the community. About 80% of the carbon um, in terrestrial ecosystems is stored underground. And soil samples are used to study carbon cycling, also carbon climate uh, feedbacks. It's important to remember that soil is very much alive with hundreds and hundreds of different types of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and a single little bit of soil. It has a microbiome that's almost actually like the dark matter in terms of what we know about it. So these authors used over a thousand samples from 12 neon domains, so not, not 20, but 12. They collected mid-infrared spectra from these soils and developed models that can be applied to predict soil horizon and orders across neon sites and across potentially across the globe. So the use of neon data in modeling and forecasting is what um, this emphasizes. The example on the right is similar. These, uh, these authors wanted to predict the composition of the soil microbiome. So they used neon soil microbe genomic data from, again, 12 domains, and they built and trained models that were validated using the soil data collected across neon. Um, and they can, these are then used to predict how microbial uh, communities can function. Um, and how that function will change in terms of carbon cycling and nutrient cycling. So this kind of knowledge could have huge implications for agriculture, climate change, and, and many other um, aspects. And then finally, natural disasters for research, are, so natural disasters at NEON are research opportunities for others, you could say, um, as natural Disturbances are accelerated through climate warming. Opportunities may likely knock multiple times at our door to provide the chance to study these natural experiments. Of course, these aren't ideal for the observatory, but we are built for climate resilience. So these researchers use hurricane damage at a neon site um, as an opportunity to study forest recovery. They use remote sensing data that was collected before and then again, after the hurricane, in combination with the CO2, CO2 flux data from the towers um, to develop their model. And they found <clears throat> that forest structure is a primary driver of recovery after uh, hurricanes. So this model can then be used for post-disaster forest management. My very last example um, is an example of how we try to work with local communities across all of our NEON domains. So um, we are greatly dispersed and have 20 domains and 81 sites located and very adjacent to many very, very different types of communities. So this gives us a lot of opportunities to, <clears throat> to use our partnerships and develop new partnerships in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, this example is from our Puerto Rico domain, where one of our NEON field staff, pictured here, is working with the local community to help understand and mitigate contamination of a local well um, using NEON data and um, uh, systems to, to basically try to understand this. So the impact of humanity on Earth's biological systems is likely to be quite complex. Um, we are eager to see NEON data perhaps used even in concert with those from other observatories represented here to better predict the directions of future change on Earth. My last slide is a big thank you for the awesome team that I work with, many of whom are in this room and pictured here so you can find them. Um, please look for them. Um, they lead key pieces of this observatory. Many of them were involved in the construction 
and <clears throat> hardy souls are still um, here leading um, with with great insights and um, energy to keep this investment um, top notch. So all of us are happy to answer any questions. Thank you.